We are in a series of Ephesians. We've been out of it for a little while, so we're going to go back. So we're going to get a little bit of review. Uh, but the book of Ephesians pretty much is all about this. Uh, the whole uh, It's this. By, basically, it says, from identity to destiny. And the book of Ephesus, or Ephesians, was written to the church in a geographical location of Ephesus. Ephesus was a metropolitan area in the time of the Apostle Paul. It was a place of tremendous wealth, of culture. It was also a place of a lot of idolatry. There was the goddess of Diane. There was temple prostitution. There was violence. There was slavery. All the ills of society, you think it's bad in America, it was bad. It was like Las Vegas times 100. It was pretty bad. And the Apostle Paul is writing to this community of believers in which he spent about three years with, and now he is in prison. He's in prison, and he's writing. This is one of the prison epistles. Epistle, it simply means a letter. And I just want to encourage you. I think maybe some of you might hear this today, but sometimes we, we wonder, God, what's going on in my life? Why am I quarantined? Why am I stuck in this job? Why is this situation taking place in my life? And you're thinking you should be a further along than you are. But do you realize the Apostle Paul, he could have been feeling sorry for himself that he's in prison. But you know what he did while he was in prison? He wrote the epistles. And chances are, if he was not incarcerated, we would not have these letters today. So what I encourage us always to do is to embrace wherever God places us and say, Lord, how can I make this something good? And God can do that. And that's what he did through the Apostle Paul. And so we've been talking about a whole thing about identity. But before we go on that, I want to ask you guys a question. If I say be a put-on, is that a positive thing? If I say, Andrew, you're a put-on, I can do that because Andrew and I know each other. Would that, be a, would that be a compliment or would that be a negative thing? Negative, right? So when you say put-on, what do you think the person is? He's not fake. He's a great guy, okay? In fact, he's my stunt double. Uh, <laughs> you'll see in a few moments, people often think that's me up there singing, and it's Andrew. He's a lot better looking than I am. He's more muscular, and uh, he's got, anyhow, we'll just stop right there. <laughs> but if you say someone's a put-on, that's not a very nice thing to say, but I want to encourage you that God wants us to be putting on. Not putting on weight, but he wants us to put, be a put-on. So look at your neighbor said, be a put-on. All right? Be a put-on. Put on Christ. God wants us to put on Christ. Well, how are we supposed to put on Christ? Well, the Bible talks about this in Ephesians today. We're going to look at how we can put on, take off, and put on Christ Jesus. That we don't have to live with this being, being negative. We don't have to live with this old nature anymore. That you and I can have victory over situations in our life. Next week, we're going to get more detailed how to deal with anger, how to deal with these issues that we can't seem to get rid of. And so today I'm going to talk about this, to be a put-on, put on Christ. Why do we want to put on Christ for? Well, how to put on Christ is very simple. It's all about our identity. And we've been talking about that. Your identity leads to your destiny. Your identity leads to your destiny. What you think about yourself actually shapes your life. I was just talking to Kevin, a gentleman in our, our congregation, and I was also... Uh, last service, I gave an illustration of a, a young teacher who began a whole movement within the educational system, especially in the inner city. She went to this area, and the third graders barely got into third grade. There was a lot of fighting. Their reading skills were way off. There was violence. There was all kinds of trouble going on in the school system. And she was also a psychology major, and she tried an experiment that was so successful they began to implement it in many of the schools, including Kevin, who taught in the, middle, taught in the inner city. And this is what they would do. Everyone knows that usually if you're in second grade, you want to be a third grader, right? If you're in third grade, you want to be a fourth grader. So she would say, you guys are going to be fourth graders and you're scholars. What's a scholar? A scholar was someone who's smart, who learns, who, make, who contributes. And she began to call them Scholar Andrew, Scholar Kevin, Scholar Lydia, right? And she began Scholar Jim. And so what she would do, she would speak even though they were not that way, she would speak that they're a scholar. And she'd say, you are, you are a winner. You can do things. And what happened was their reading levels went up by over four marks, uh, went four grades. In addition to that, they all got A's and B's at the end of the year. And they were, 
the best class they had, and they began to study what she was doing, and now they're implementing in some of the schools, especially in their inner cities. And the question is this, what made these children change is they changed their identity. They began to believe that they were scholars. They began to believe that they were smart. They began to believe that because, my friends, make no mistake about it, how you think controls the way you live. Now, that works whether you're a believer or not. Now, how much better when you think the true thoughts of Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit and the community of believers, watch what God can do in our lives. You don't have to live a certain life. You don't have to live in that sin. You don't have to live with that propensity. You are not stuck. You are overcoming in Christ Jesus. But how we do that is we have to put off and put on And that's what we're going to talk about today. So your identity leads to your destiny. How you think about yourself controls your life. And remember, we talked about this week in, week out. We cannot find who we are without knowing who God is. And if we want to change our destiny, we must change what we think about God and what we think about ourselves. Remember, everybody, the two most important thoughts that shape your life at any given moment is what you think about God, even if you don't believe in God. If you don't believe in God, it's still what you think about God shapes your life and what you think about yourself. So if we have that right, it goes so much better. If you have it wrong, it causes all kinds of trouble. So the book of Ephesians does a masterful job of explaining who we are because there's an identity crisis in our land today. There always has been an identity crisis, but especially now in our culture, it's rising to a fever pitch. So today we're going to be talking about how we can put off and put on. So in Ephesians 2.1, I want to just remind you of what we've been talking about, who you are in Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says you are if you've given your life to Christ. It says, and you were dead. Isn't that good news? You were dead in the trespasses in sin. So you and I were dead in trespasses and sin. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, we, he made us alive together with Christ. So we were dead and we became alive with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him. And so our identity is that we we died with Christ and we rise with Christ, that our identity is wrapped up not in who we are, but who he is. That you and I have his credit card. You and I have his identity. You've been adopted into the family of Jesus Christ if you've given your life to Christ. And you're raised up with him and seated with him in heavenly places. You see, our identity is not in ourselves. It's in Jesus Christ. Because this is the deal, everybody. God does not make good people better. He makes dead people alive. You cannot get better. No matter who you are, you're not good enough. Aren't you glad you came to church today to hear you're not good enough? I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. And I'm telling you, I'll say it to the day I die. It is one of the best things you could ever know. None of us are good enough. But Jesus Christ is good enough. And so he does not make good people better. He makes dead people alive. Without Christ, you were dead on the inside. Your spirit was dead. But in Christ, you are alive and you're seated with him. Let let me explain a little bit more about this just so to remind everybody. Okay, my identity, I, I am Italian and German descent, and I live in the United States of America. That's true. But my identity beyond that is I'm a child of God who happens to have an Italian, look out, and Ger- what a crazy combination, Italian and German ancest- ancestry, and I live in the United States of America. So what brings me together, what makes me in Christ is Christ Jesus, So no matter what you are, if you're from Vietnam, if you're from India, if you're from Bangladesh, if you're from Colombia, why do I say Colombia? Why Colombia's in this church? Because I'm married to one. So what happens is my identity is not wrapped up in my geographical location or my heritage. My identity is in Jesus Christ. And the beautiful thing is this. No matter who we are or what we come through, our identity should be in Christ first. So it's not like I am a... I'm an American that's a Christian. I'm not a Christian American. I'm a Christian that lives in America. Does that make sense? And and, and so I I am not a Republican Christian. I'm a Christian that might vote Democrat or Republican, but my identity is not wrapped up in a political party. 
My identity is wrapped up in who Jesus is. And we have to be very careful that our identification and our identity is wrapped up in Christ first. Don't be fooled by the enemy. Don't be fooled by different people. Your identity is in Christ. And we must be very careful, no matter what we do, that we separate that. Because the world's ways are not the right ways. Christ is always the right way. And the Bible says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, right? It's not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Wouldn't it be nice if no one boasted anymore? Aren't you tired of people that boast? Isn't it annoying people boast and say how good they are? You ever notice how people boast? You know, don't you wish sometimes they would, you know, fail a little bit? How many of you like going, I mean, I think the best thing I can tell if I'm in the flesh or not is looking at social media. Imagine this for a moment. You and your family, you take them out and you get, a, you get a pizza. Then you run to Sleeping Giant State Park. You climb the top. You take pictures. And then afterwards, you're done. You get ice cream. And you're so excited. You post it on Instagram. You post it on Facebook. You post it on Twitter. And then you see somebody else in the Swiss Alps <laughs> on a riverboat cruise. And you're thinking to yourself, Oh, man, that's not, how could they afford that? They must be doing something wrong. And, and you get jealous of them. You feel inferior. Am I the only one? Okay, one of the greatest tests that God gives us is social media. When you can look at somebody else and feel jealous about them, you know there's an issue in your life. How much better is it that we don't care about ourselves anymore? We want to honor God and honor the body that God has given us. You see, the Bible says this, for we are his what? Workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're created for good works. Do you realize that? Good works don't save you, but you're created for good works in Christ Jesus, which God prepared before him that we should walk in it. So God has a purpose and a plan for your life, but wouldn't it be nice if we could be a team instead of by ourselves? You see, we have a collective responsibility called team. Together, everyone achieves more. You know, the New York Yankees have been having a rough season. Uh, Aaron Judge, who I happen to like, was in Los Angeles playing the Los Angeles Dodgers, and he did a magnificent catch in the outfield. And the, the, the dodo heads at, uh, at the L.A. Dodgers, they didn't uh, put the gate correctly, so the gate came through, and he broke his toe. So he's been out of the lineup. And so we've been struggling. So what Aaron Judge had to do, he had to recoup himself. He had to go, you know, he was still in the dugout, still encouraging people, but he had to what? He had to work on himself, but the team was hurt because... Boy, we need Aaron Judge. We won last night, by the way. Come on now. Hey. Okay. So we got collective responsibility. And then we had this. Rather, here's what the Bible says, rather speaking the truth in love, we, see how that is? We, we're a body of Christ. We're a team. We grow, we are to grow up in every way unto him who's the head. We're, we're supposed to grow up together as a team. We're supposed to take the field. We're supposed to score the touchdowns into Christ, from whom the whole body is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, that we work together. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow that it builds itself up in love. Wouldn't it be nice if you could see someone be in the Swiss Alps and you are a sleeping giant and you're happy for them? You're having ice cream, they're having caviar. Of course, I don't like caviar anyhow, so I'm happy I'm not having caviar, but you know what I'm saying. Wouldn't it be great if we had a place like that where if someone's kids do well, you're happy? If, if someone gets married, you're happy. If someone gets a new job, you're happy. If their kids do well in school and they get into full scholarship and you can barely get into Nagatuck Valley, you're okay with that? That you rejoice in someone else's success? Think about it. Every time you compare yourself to somebody or feel less than, what happens? You start feeling insecure. Anxiety comes upon you. Uh, depression comes upon you. you. You start feeling jealous. All these negative emotions which cause your mental health to go down causes you to struggle to have happiness. But what happens when we don't care about that? I want to see you succeed. We want to be a church that does not compete. We want to be a church that completes each other, that we help each other win. If you win, I win. This is how a team works. The enemy would get us to compare ourselves to each other. So when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow 
so that it builds itself up in love. Wouldn't it be nice to have a community like that? That's what Cornerstone Church is becoming more and more of. And we have to work on that together as a community. So we have collective responsibility, and then we have the individual responsibilities as well. So not only are you a part of the team, but you got to do your part. Like Aaron Judge has been in rehab and, and working on his foot and working on his batting, and so he's been working hard privately that when he works publicly with the team, he contributes, and he hit a home run last night. Can I hear an amen? Okay. I won a lot of money on that one. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, don't, I don't bet. Okay. Now, this is what I say, and I testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the fertility of their minds. That's what the Apostle Paul says as we move on to the next part of the passage. Now, what's so interesting is, you know who he wrote this to? The letter of Ephesians is written primarily to Gentile Christians. So why, there was some Jewish there, but primarily it was Gentile. So it's like me saying, I urge you, Cornerstone, I urge you, Cornerstone, to testify that you no longer walk as the Americans do. You don't walk as the Americans do in the futility of their minds. So what he's basically saying is that, wait a minute, they're Gentiles, but you don't walk that way. Remember, we talked about this. My identity is not that I'm a U.S. citizen. My identity is that I am seen with Christ in heavenly places, that I, have a, that I am a citizen of heaven, and this is only a temporary place. I am going through. I'm like on vacation. Imagine, if you will, if you were on vacation and you stop at the, uh, the truck stop in Southington, and then you decide to build a house there at the truck stop. First of all, you get arrested for that, but, but imagine, I'm going to make my life here at the truck stop. No, that's not your home. You're only passing through. So what we want to do is realize that our citizenship is in heaven, and no matter how hard you try, this is not heaven. So what you need to do is lower your, ex lower your expectations so you can raise them. The best is yet to come in Christ Jesus. Doesn't mean we don't try hard. Doesn't mean we do the best we can. But this is not heaven. It's never going to be heaven. Our home is in another place. And we're seen with Christ already. We have citizenship. That's good news, everybody. And that should encourage us. And the reason why you're longing for something more is because there's something more. As C.S. Lewis said, a fish never asks itself, why is it wet? But human beings are the only creatures that ask why they are existing. And the fact that you ask that question proves that there's a God. And so I'm paraphrasing what he said. No longer walk in the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. How you think controls everything. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, Due to their hardness of heart, hardness of heart, they have become callous, getting themselves over to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. Let me give you an example of what's happening. Back in 1945, July 30th, 1945, there was a ship called the USS Indianapolis. It was returning from a mission of delivering a rich uranium to Allied forces in the Pacific. It did not make it home. In fact, a Japanese torpedo hit the cruiser on its way back. It sank in minutes, in fact, 12 minutes. 300 of the 1,200 men died. 900 went into the water, enduring four days and five nights without water in the blazing sun in the Pacific. Only 900 that went into the water, only 316 survived because of the lack of water and the sharks. It's been the summer of the sharks, by the way. Anyhow, let's move on. <laughs> One of those who survived was a chief medical officer who recorded his own experience. I'm going to read what he wrote. Listen to this. There was nothing I could do, nothing I could do but give advice, bury the dead at sea in safe life jackets, and try to keep the men from drinking the water. When the hot sun came out, and we were in this crystal clear ocean, we were so thirsty, you couldn't believe it wasn't good enough to drink. I had a hard time convincing the men that they shouldn't drink. The real young ones, you take away their hope, you take away their water, 
and they would drink the salt water and they would go fast and die. I can remember striking them. He was actually, hey, hey stop. He'd actually hit them. He's striking them. The Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend. He's striking them who were drinking the salt water to try to stop them. They would get dehydrated and then become manacle, and they had mass hallucinations. So here you have people all seeing the same thing. Why? Because ideology is like a virus. It can catch on. So you see something, another person sees it, and their imagination takes off. I was amazed how everyone would see the same thing. One man would see something, and then everyone else would see it. Even I fought the hallucinations off and on. Something always brought me back. What brought him back? The reality. You don't recognize that we're in a society today that there's mass hallucinations taking place. People are seeing something, and you're seeing it too. Why? Because we're drinking the water. You see, you can't drink salt water and survive. You will die. And so many of us, we're being fooled by our culture. We see what's going on. We see the clear water and we're drinking it. We're not even aware that we're going down the stream. We're going down a death spiral, but we're not even aware of it. This is what can happen to our minds. Our minds begin to lose the capacity to tell what's true and what's false because God will give us over to a reprobate mind. This is what happened. Due to the hardness of their hearts, they became callous and gave themselves up to sensuality, greedy, and practice every kind of impurity. Romans chapter 1 is a parallel passage which kind of shows the progression or degression. It's what this says. For the wrath of God. You know what the wrath is? Wrath is the, the friction of God. When you have perfection, you have God coming together. God's perfection cannot handle imperfection. There has to be a covering of this great fire, and that fire is the covering of the blood of Jesus Christ, which is like a like an asbestos fire suit where you can walk through the wrath of God. Without it, you burn up. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Why? God made things well, right? And unrighteous of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, not doing the right things. How do they do that? For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature had been clearly perceived. I Just the other day, Randy and I and, and Sam, we were flying back from a conference and we were flying in the air. It was sunset. It was unbelievable. I never saw anything so beautiful for sunset. We opened the window of the plane. We kept the window shut, but we opened the and we could see a beautiful sunset. And I'm, I mean, a number of people were taking their phones and taking pictures of it. It was gorgeous. Now, imagine saying, oh, that happened by accident. When you see the birth of a baby, when you see the beauty, everyone knows there's a God. Even atheists know that there's a God. People say, why? I, I, I follow science. I mean, you don't follow science because science is nothing more than information. When you come up with an opinion, that becomes your theology. That becomes your religion. The fact that you don't have a religion is a religion in itself. And so for what can be known about God is plain. His individual attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived. Ever since the creation of the world, the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Everyone has a sense of God in them. And so how do they respond to the God they know? Are you saying that everyone goes to heaven? No. The Bible says there's only one way a man or woman can be saved. It's through Jesus Christ. The only assurance of salvation and going before God in heaven is through Jesus Christ. He's the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. I don't know what's going to happen to everybody, but I know they have to go through Jesus. The only assurance is through Jesus Christ. And the earth has a virus, and you and I are the antidote, the blood of Jesus. People need to get the blood of Jesus in them to fight the infection of sin to set them free. And so we have the antidote of the virus of sin, and that's why God has us go out there. I don't know what's going to happen to all those people, but I know they have to go through Jesus. And Jesus told us to go throughout all the earth and preach the gospel. We make a mistake when we go beyond that. And so this is what we need to do. So Christ is the antidote for this, right? So they are without excuse because they know better. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. They know God. Everyone knows there's a God. Or give thanks to him. You know, you know one of the ways you protect yourself from delusion? You know one of the ways you protect yourself from depression and anxiety? I'm not suggesting, I know some folks struggle with anxiety and struggle with depression and we're not making people feel bad. 
But what I will tell you is this. If you don't do, if you give thanks for things and are thankful, what that does, it reduces the influx of depression and anxiety, hands down. When you begin to thank God, Lord, thank you, God, that I am not in Arizona where it's 118 degrees. Thank you, God. Today I woke up, I got outside, it was 66 degrees with no humidity. Can I hear an amen? amen. Yesterday was horrible. But anyhow, that's just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, you know, you start thanking God for what you have, right? And that's an antidote. That, that helps you, and it helps keep your mind clear. Thank you, God, in finding the good in what's taking place, understanding that the best days are ahead in Christ Jesus, always thinking through faith. That protects you from the poison of complaining. When you complain, you're not thankful, then you begin to blame God, and you go down the spiral. You go into the hospice of a sinking ship. And this is what began to happen. They didn't honor God or honor him or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. What happens is you get calloused. I play guitar, right? If I don't play guitar for a while, if I play, my, my fingers might bleed a little bit. I'll get blisters because I'm not used to playing. But when I play every day, what happens? I build up these calluses. What can happen to us as well? A little sin here, a little sin there. You're not aware of it, how far you've drifted. You build up these calluses. You're not even aware of it. And you drift way off path. Never forget when I was growing up in Long Island, not Long Island. Long Island, New York, we used to go to a place called Jones Beach, which is a nice beach, by the way. At least it used to be. And I had this, I'm not going to give the guy's name in case he get, comes onto this thing somehow. But uh, I'll just call his name, his, call his name Randy. I'll call him Randy. And so, so this is the boy Randy. Uh, we went swimming together, and uh, my father and mother brought him to the beach with us, and we were swimming, and we are having a good old time. And, you know, I noticed, like, that camera would be like a lifeguard stand. I'd be sitting there swimming and riding the waves, which I love to do. And the next thing I know, I'm way, I'm way down here. Ooh, I get back here. So I, I go back again. I was getting kind of thirsty. I'm like, I'm going to get something to drink. So I, I left the ocean, went to the, the umbrella where my parents were. Uh, back in those days, we were sun, no sunblock. We put oil on ourselves and put my mother sitting there with aluminum foil <laughs> Looked like a turkey dinner. Uh, but anyhow, we were so dumb back in those days. But that's beside the point. So I, I'm sitting there, and I, I, my dad goes, where's Randy? Oh, he's swimming. In the, where's Randy? So my dad goes to look for Randy. Randy is nowhere to be found. We looked for 30 minutes, could not find where Randy was. Going up and down the bridge, telling the lifeguards. David Hasselhoff came pretty soon to help us out. <laughs> running with your red, red swim trunks. But anyhow, we finally went down the beach, and he was about a quarter, Randy was about a quarter mile down from the beach, and he had no clue what was going on. I was riding the waves. My dad was so irate, he gave him a spanking. It wasn't even his son. Can you imagine that? Do you know in my neighborhood, when I was growing up, if I did something wrong, the neighbors', would, neighbors parents would spank me? Okay, that's for next week. But the bottom line was this. He, Randy had no clue what was going on. He was just going with the tide. And the tide took him down. He was enjoying himself, but he lost the location. And what's happening to our culture is we're losing the location of God. We're, everyone's swimming. We're deluded together. We have these false things in our minds. We start believing lies. We start having mass hysteria. It can happen. Don't make, make no mistake. There is something. You can get a virus of the mind and believing the pan, you can be a pandemic of the mind believing false information this is what began to happen so claim to be wise they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immoral god immortal god excuse me to the images resembling mortal man and birds and animals are more important have you noticed that there's a little bullfrog a, a, a salamander we care more about a salamander oh my gosh we cannot build we cannot put an addition on because they have salamanders meanwhile we're abort children we care more about the creatures then we do the creator and the God's handiwork of men, mankind. This is what begins to happen. We start worshiping creation, the creeping things. Therefore, God, this is, a, this is an indictment. This is the worst thing that can happen to you and I. The worst thing that can happen to you and I, when God says, okay, have it your way. God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity. When God gives you up to yourself, look out. Now check this out. He gave them up in the lust of their flesh, hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies. We see a dishonoring of bodies today like never before. When you hear about, teen, when you hear about school-age children, when you hear about teenage girls having mastectomies because they're trying to be men, 
When, when children who don't even know they should have uh, what cereal to have, we're telling kids that you could be a boy or a girl. That's abuse, everybody. That's wrong. That's wrong. I'm not denying there's people that have mental health problems. We should help them and have compassion. But when dishonoring of their bodies, what, what, this is happening in our society today. People are taking hormones and, 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 and giving up their, their ability to even have kids one day. And, and they're dishonoring their bodies. They're doing all these crazy things. The mutilation. They're not even allowing it in Amsterdam right now. And the United States has it up to the age of 18, 19. This is part of this. Now listen, the problem is this. God is giving us over. We're on that raft. People are drinking the stuff. This mass hysteria. Everyone believes it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Because there's a contagion of the mind. And you begin to believe a lie. And this is what's happening. What do we do? If we're not careful. We get thrown into this culture. We get sucked into it. And we start going down this, this death spiral. So the heart's impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies. Listen, the reason I'm bringing this up for because they're dishonoring the bodies of Christ among themselves. Because of their, they exchange the truth for God for a lie. For a lie. And worshiped and served the creation. Rather than the creator, we're more concerned about a coral reef and the keys of Florida than we are what it is to be a man or a woman. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because it's the very fundamental building blocks of what it means to be a human being is, under, is now under attack. That's the depravity. That's, that's what's going on. Listen, it's not what's happened is they are deprived. They are fooled. There's a virus of the mind out there. And so we don't say we're better, but we say there's truth and there's lies, and those are lies. And so that is a symptom of a greater problem. You understand what I'm trying to say? We're not just picking on that, but that shows where we are. So about God for a lie, worship and serve the creator rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So in Ephesians, we go back, it says this, what? They are darkened in their understanding due to the hardness of their hearts. When your heart gets hard, look out. When God tells you to do something, no matter how small it is, do it. Do not do not delay. Do not forget when God speaks to you. Because what can happen is that every time you say, oh, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. A callus forms on your heart. Where no longer do you care anymore. And it gets to the point where you have no ability to say what's right and wrong anymore. I'm telling you right now, all of us, everyone in this room, including myself, myself most of all, could fall into any sin on the planet. If I continually deny God's grace, continue to deny his way, all of us are prone to do every sin in the book. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. You don't recognize how wretched you are without God and how incredible blessed you are with him. We must understand that sin is toxic. Sin will take anyone down, and we don't have a right to look better than anyone else. It's only by God's grace that we respond. So this is what's going on when God gives us over. So how do we change? We need to change where we're living. See, what can happen is the hardness of heart, that they, they have become callous and they have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, and the practice of every kind of impurity. But, I love the buts in the Bible. I should have read a book called The Buts of the Bible. I'm sure it would sell really well until they open it up. But that is not the way you learn Christ. So don't you praise God for that? Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth in Jesus. Put off your old self. I like, what, uh, I like what Oswald Chambers says. I, one of the most impactful statements I ever saw, a devotional I read one time from my utmost of his highest. He says, every day we should have a white funeral. I always hear Billy Idol call about a white wedding. No, a white funeral where every day I declared, here is Eric dead. I'm alive to Christ and dead to myself. Every day we have to slay the old man. It's like the Terminator movie. If you remember that movie where uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's this uh, the thing from the future and you think you killed the thing, the next thing the arm is going down trying to grab you. That's how sin is. Every day you got to go after it, right? So put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt. So what God is telling us is just take off. You actually have to put off the old way. But this is not good enough to put off. Yeah, put it off. What does the Bible say? Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, is corrupt through deceitful desires. And be what? Renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do you renew yourself? 
through your mind. Your mind is the gateway. Your mind is the gateway. What you think about, you will drive towards. It's been proven time and time again through the Bible and even through, uh, even through neurological science. What you focus upon, you will do if it's good or bad. And so you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on. So you got to take off, right? And then what you got to do is you got to put on. You just don't take off. The Bible talks about this. Jesus says about a place that was cleaned of demons, that they took, they cleaned it out, but they didn't fill it with something else, and something worse came. So when you pull all the weeds, you need to plant some flowers. So you take off the old, and you put on the new. you got to put it on. The good news is it's prepared for you. you got to put it on. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was shopping for, um, sorry, everybody, but underwear. I like cotton. I just like cotton, okay? So I look at the package. You know what the package says? For best use, change daily. <laughs> well, gee, I had to stop turning it inside out every day. I didn't know that. That's pretty obvious, right? For best use, put off yourself every single day. Put off and put on. So you need to be a put on. You need to be a put on by taking off and putting on. Now, this is the issue here. So put on the new self created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, that's what we're supposed to do. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. Get put on. We're being told you have to listen to your urges or you hurt yourself. If I listened to my urges, I'd have 25 life sentences. I'd have five life sentences from going to the motor to vehicle and letting myself go. <laughs> right? If I do what you feel, if I did what I feel, are you kidding me? But we're telling people, you have to listen to your passions. No, you don't. If it's wrong, don't listen to it. We're like those sailors on that raft. We have to make sure we're drinking the true, clean water of Jesus Christ. We have no obligation. Well, it's my nature. If I did what I wanted to do, look out. You are not an animal. You are a child of God. You're under no obligation to give into sexual temptation. You have no obligation to give into drug addiction. You're under no obga- ob- obligation to give into homosexuality or anything else for that matter. You have, you're under no obligation. Don't let anyone tell you that. You are created in Christ Jesus. You are a new child. No obligation. Well, I'm depressed. You're under no obligation for that. Believe the word of God, what God defines me, not my sin. And we're not better than anyone else. Everyone's afraid to talk about this. We are under no obligation. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Do what your sinful nature urges you to do. That is a recipe for death. So, how to put on Christ. Take off the old. You got to take off the old and you got to put on the new. But the problem often is this. You see, God doesn't want you to stop doing something. Don't stop doing something. Replace. Replace. So we have a dear friend of us in the church. I'm not going to mention his name. His name is not Randy. And uh, he was a chain smoker. And he struggled with cigarettes. And I talked about this in the men's group at 6, at, at six o'clock in the morning on Wednesdays, which you should come to if you're, if you're a man. And, and what happened, he said, I was really struggling with cigarette smoking. So what I did is I changed it. So every time I want to have a cigarette, what I would do is I would go outside and I'd chew gum. And I replaced it. I stopped trying not to smoke, and I chose to replace it with gum. And that's how we got free in the natural. So what you and I need to do is take off the old and put on the new. You need to replace. Don't try to stop. But sometimes this is what we do. Okay, I'll give my life to Jesus. And we put this on, but we don't take off the old. Well, I'm a Christian. I go to church on Sunday. I, I listen to K-Love. I eat Chick-fil-A. I'm good. <laughs> right? And so you put, you, put, you put the new jacket in, and you're like, oh, man, it's not, kind of uncomfortable. And you got this thing on, and the problem is this doesn't work. You can't put on the new without taking off the old. Right? You can fool other people, but God knows what's going on. So we have to take off. Even this, we have to take off completely the old, right? Acknowledge that you have it on, and then exchange it for the new. And you put it on. You put on Christ. And every day, 
You have to remember that. So every day you change your inner garments and outer garments, do you not? Think about every day when you take a shower, I need the shower of God upon me, and I need to take off the old and put on the new. Take off the old. Therefore, dear brothers, you have an obligation. We mentioned that already. You must also consider yourselves what? Dead. dead. I'm dead to that. I'm under no obligation, and I am dead to that. So take off the old, put on Christ by changing your mind. We change by changing the way we think. And the problem of this is this. Don't stop, but replace. This is how we change our lives. Now, I want to encourage you. One of the most important scriptures in the Bible in regards to changing is this. I appeal to you. The Apostle Paul says through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Brothers, by the mercies of God, to what? Present. Present. That's what God wants us to do. Can I clean myself on my own? There's a shower head. I have to present myself in the shower. I have to take off the old, and I have to step into the shower. You take off, and you step in there. Present yourself, your bodies, as what? Living sacrifices. You see, this is an ongoing process. That's why the Oswald Chambers says it is, the, uh, it is a white funeral every day. Here lies Eric Bucci. Here's Christ Jesus. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed, shaped to this world. Everyone thinks it's okay to drink the seawater. There's mass delusion out there where everyone thinks it's okay. No. The Bible says wide is the road to hell. Narrow is the path of life. Do not be conformed to this world, shaped. But what? What? Transform. Metamorphosis, we get the Greek word from. It's when a caterpillar becomes a, goes into a chrysalis and becomes a butterfly. God will change us. How? Transform by what? By the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We need to trans. We need to transform our mind by focusing on what's true, what's noble, what's of good character. And it's so difficult these days because we have all this information around us saying the wrong thing. We're getting pickled by our culture. What we need to do is get our mind out of the pickled jar of this culture and begin to submerge our mind in the clean water of the Word of God. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, husband, wash your wife in the water of the Word. The Word of God will cleanse us and, and will give us a clean mind where we can be able to understand what's going on. So we have to change. Watch what you're thinking about, everybody. We have to transform our minds. What are we listening to? What self-talk is anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of Jesus Christ has to be cast down. So you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. Next week, we're going to talk about how to take off anger, how to take off other things from practical, pragmatic steps that the Bible talks about. You may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of the life. Take off through deceitfulness and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I recognize all of us, myself included. Father, we often keep on the old clothes. Lord, so many of us are allowing ourselves to be shaped by the world. Lord, we're letting the, we're letting the, the ways of the world, the entertainment of the world, the philosophies of the world, the methodologies of the world, uh, Lord, we're, we're getting ourselves into a mass delusion. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you wake us up, Lord. Father, we want to renew our minds. We want to take off the old. Take off the old. We want to put on the new, Lord God. And so, Jesus, we're asking for that today, Lord. Father, I pray for right now, anyone that's here today that's feeling like they can't change and that, that this is their orientation or this is their, this is their problem they have, their marriage is, un, is not fixable or they don't think they're smart enough to go to school, they don't think they're worthy enough to get married or they don't think it's... It, they think it's not good enough to have a job or be somebody. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that the lies of the enemy would be destroyed. And Father, that you love every single person and that every person has great value to you. Father, we want to take off the old and put on the new. Father, would you change our minds? We want to change our minds, Father. Forgive us for allowing ourselves to be on that raft of this life and living in a mirage 
mass delusion. Lord God, we can choose to follow your ways in Jesus' name. We thank you for those that are in Christ, are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for every single person, myself included. Lord, we pray that we put on anew. Lord, I pray that we would be connected to the body. We would help each other out, Lord Jesus. Lord, we would complete each other. We would bless each other. We would be very humble, recognizing that any of us could fall into any temptation, that we would be gracious to each other. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you that there is therefore no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that our sin does not define us, but our Savior Jesus does and that we're seated with you in heavenly places. I thank you that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Lord, I pray for healing in this place, healing of marriages, healing of relationships, healing of orientations that are not healthy, an orientation of depression, an orientation of anxiety, an orientation of worry, an orientation that's not right in regards to substances. Lord, we pray that our orientation will be changed to who we are in you, in Jesus' name.